My topic today is how we can make employee evaluations a useful tool. And I know that most of you came here today just to hear about this topic. There's nothing more exciting that we do in our work environment than employee evaluation. So let's take a few minutes to look at this topic from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, I will ask you, what is the purpose of employee evaluation? Motivation. The purpose of the employee motivation is to motivate. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Did you say something? Yes, yes. <laughs> The purpose of the employee evaluation is to motivate employees. How many of you agree with that? That's the purpose. No. Okay, a few hands. <laughs> All right then, what's the purpose of these employee evaluations? Feedback. Feedback. Anything else? Great performance. Great performance. Set goals. Okay. I have a... I have a communication style that is rather direct. I'm a rather assertive person. And in my other job that I still do, I still practice law at my own little law firm, it requires me to be very direct and assertive with people. So today with you in our short time together, I'm going to be rather direct. Part of one of the focuses of the performance evaluations is to ensure that you create the workforce that is the most appropriate for your organization. And how you're going to do that is you're going to use the employee evaluations as a tool to weed out those people who are not going to make the commitment that you need. Have any of you, for example, have any of you ever worked with at your organization someone who is a whiner? <laughs> Anyone ever worked with someone who's a whiner? A few people are saying yes. Uh -huh. And by a whiner, to clarify what I mean, I mean a whiner is someone perhaps who you might see them in the morning at work, and you might walk by them and you might say, hi, good morning. And they might say to you, what's good about it? <laughs> and then they might walk around work and say things like, um, another day, another dollar. They don't appreciate me here. They don't pay me what I'm worth. One of the things that we don't focus on, I don't think appropriately enough in our organizations, is how important attitude is. Are there any companies that actually hire their new employees based on attitude? Can you think of any companies that do this? Yeah, there are. I'll share one with you. There's a company, it's an airline. There's a company that's an airline, and it's called Southwest Airlines. Anyone heard of this company? Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty successful. Now, the airline industry right now overall, is it doing pretty well, the airlines? No. Mm, some are doing okay. Some are, some are having some challenges, and that's all right. But Southwest has been a leader in their industry for many, many years, financially, and certainly in their hiring and their layoffs. And one of the things that Southwest does is they hire for attitude. And so what we're going to do is we're going to examine with our performance evaluations how we can use these. Because every once in a while, even if you have the best recruiters and you have the best interview staff, every once in a while, one of these individuals with a bad attitude, they will slip through your system and they will become an employee. And once they get on board, your goal as an organization and your managers and your HR team, your goal is what? Well, choice A, we can assist them with changing their attitude and we can use performance evaluations to do that. And what's choice B if they do not change their attitude? Fire. Oh, y'all are so mean. Oh, I've heard so many things about New Yorkers. I live down in Austin, Texas. Oh, my goodness. I would actually agree with that. I will agree with that. This is what I'm saying. There are some times in our lives that people get into work situations. And there are some people that work with you right now. And the only reason that they get out of bed, brush their teeth, and put on their work clothes and show up, the only reason is for their paycheck. That's it. You have some people who work where you are right now. And they do not care about your mission statement. They do not care about your values. They don't care about the co-workers. The only thing they're there for is their paycheck. And some of these individuals do have bad attitude. And what we need to do is assist them 
with changing that attitude or with finding another environment more conducive to their personal taste. <laughs> and I, Where we find that? ah, yes, I understand this concept from so many perspectives. I understand this concept, the concept of assisting these people from a legal perspective. Um, do you think that people with that attitude, do you think these people are more likely or less likely to file lawsuits? More likely. Yeah, they're more likely. The people who come to work and they complain and they're unhappy and they don't like anything about it. This is the group most likely to file EEOC claims. This is the group most likely to come talk to lawyers like myself. And I know this because I've met many of these people at my law practice. I met a young lady a few years ago, I'll never forget, this young lady comes into my law office, she called me on the phone crying hysterically, and she said, oh, I have to hire a lawyer, they fired me for no reason, I gotta sue. So she came in, I said, tell me about what happened at your company. She told me, she said, I work for an insurance company. She said, I've been there for two years and I have been the best employee they ever could have imagined. And I said, my goodness, that's wonderful. And then she said, I have performance evaluations to back it up. Sure enough, I read her performance evaluations, I start reading them in chronological order, and what do I see? This young lady has received the highest rating on every one of her performance evaluations. But I noticed a little comment on one of the performance evaluation sections for comments. Her supervisor had written down she said, um, <clears throat> we'll call her Susie. She said, uh, Susie is a wonderful performer, but Susie needs to try to get to work on time. Hmm, that comment seemed a little strange to me. So what question do you think I asked Susie there in my law office? Yeah, I said, Susie, has there been an issue with you getting to work on time? And she looked at me and she started crying. She said, no, there's never been an issue with me getting to work on time. I told you I've been the best worker ever. And then she looked me in the eye and she said to me, you will not believe what my supervisor did to me. She said, this lady, she would demand that I answer the phone whenever it rained, even if I was doing something else important. She said, my supervisor would demand that I get up and fax things and I file things, no matter what else I was doing. And so I said, Susie, may I have a moment to look at your performance? May I have a moment to look at your job description in addition to your performance evaluations. And Susie had tears running down her face and she looked at me and she said, she said, I have been treated like a slave for two years. And when I read her, I read her job description, what do you think her job title was? Receptionist. <laughs> Answering the phone, fixing things and filing things. How dare her boss demand that of her? Do you think that this young lady, Susie, actually believed in her own mind that she had been treated like a slave? Yes. Oh, yes, she did. Oh, yes, she was serious. She was serious. Whose responsibility was it that this situation occurs, that this young lady works at this place for two years, doesn't answer the phone, doesn't fax or file things. And I will share with you, she was right. She was coming to work a lot. She showed me her, her time slips. She printed those out. But I noticed on her time slips that she never would come to work at 8 a.m. and leave at 5. Her time, sheets, her time sheets would show things like on Monday, she'd show up at 10 a.m., she'd leave at 3. On Tuesday, she'd come at noon, she'd stay till 8. She was getting 40 hours in a work week, but she was never getting 8 hours in a day. When I looked at her job description, what do you think her hours were that were required as a receptionist? Yeah, 8 to 5. So whose responsibility was it that Susie never came to work on time for two years, didn't answer the phone, didn't fax and file things? Whose responsibility was this? Supervisor. Yes, it's the supervisor. And it's HR. It's an organizational problem when I see this. And I will share with you that I have seen this many, many times. Seen what? I've seen people who did not need to stay in that organization with the behavior they were exhibiting, like not coming to work on time and not doing what they were supposed to. But poor management, poor HR, and poor training allow the situation to develop. So we're going to look at the focus of the employee evaluations, and we're going to spend some time looking at the types of skills that managers and supervisors have to have to be able to give a performance evaluation. I have actually had managers and HR professionals at my clients that I train and consult with, I've actually had them tell me things like this. 
They said to me, mm, wait till you meet Joe. Joe is the worst performer we have at this organization. Joe's got a bad attitude. Joe doesn't get along with anybody. Joe never comes to work on time. And then they look at me and they say, but we can't give Joe a poor performance evaluation. We can't write Joe up because Joe is a 65-year-old Asian man in a wheelchair. And if we give him a poor performance evaluation or write Joe up, he'll sue us. So we can't do anything. Is that the appropriate analysis of how to deal with your team members? No. No, it's not. But I have heard this from private companies and from government agencies, and it tells me that we need to get a little bit more information about the reality of the system. And we need to implement the leadership skills that are really important. So some of the things that we're going to focus on in the leadership conference in August, we're going to go over the skills you need to be an effective manager. One of the keys to being an effective manager and giving performance evaluations appropriately, you must be at all times with all of your team members, even the team members that you don't like. You must be consistent. Consistency is one of the first keys. What do I mean by consistency? I mean that when someone from outside your organization reads your performance evaluation, and will it ever happen that someone that doesn't work where you work will end up reading those performance evaluations? Will that happen? Yeah, what kinds of people will read those performance evaluations? Lawyers. Yes, yes. Yes, lawyers, happy, happy lawyers will read them. The government, like the EEOC might read them, Department of Labor might read them. So people from outside your organization will read them. And I'll tell you, in the worst case scenario, people that sit on things called juries will end up reading them. And so you must be consistent. Your performance evaluations have to make sense when somebody who doesn't work there reads them. I've read way too many performance evaluations and I always read them in chronological order that will say about the worker, it will say exceeds expectations, exceeds expectations, exceeds expectations. And then the organization fires the person. Well, does that make sense? If your paperwork says they exceeded expectations, then what is a lawyer or a jury going to think about what the real reason was the person was fired? What are they going to think? Well, they looked great on paper, so what's the reason they were fired then? Not for parting hair. Yeah. <laughs> if your paperwork shows that they were doing what they were supposed to and then you fire them, then it's going to be really easy for a lawyer, the government, <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else sitting on a jury to think, well, you must have fired them for discrimination. You must have just fired them because you didn't like them. Maybe it's because they're disabled. Maybe it's because they're elderly. And we know under federal law, at what age are you elderly and protected for your age discrimination at work? 40 years old. So the person might be 40 or 41. It might be that the person's gender or religion was an issue. The moment you're inconsistent with the government and what lawyers are going to argue in the inconsistency, I'm going to argue discrimination. And that's what I'm looking for. The performance evaluations are crucial. So we're going to look at, in our training program, when we come back to the leadership conference in August, we're going to have the opportunity in August. That's why it's such a great training. In August, we'll have Ms. Kelly Verla. She's going to talk to you about the communication skills that we need to have with coworkers, with people that we supervise, and with our supervisors. And then we're going to integrate that into dealing with people. Mr. Caruso is going to talk to us about dealing with people who are underachievers, the leadership skills that we need. And then we're also going to focus on dealing with Mr. Westwick. We're going to talk about the type of coaching and mentoring and team building skills that I need. And then what I will endeavor to do when we talk about performance evaluations that day is to tie it all together. You have to have the right communication skills. You have to be able to build a team. You need to be able to understand how to deal with these different types of performers. And you need to understand how important your paperwork is. And so when we have the opportunity to come back, I look forward to working with all of you at that juncture, and I look forward to the opportunity today to get to meet as many of you as possible and get to know you. I hope you enjoy your Friday here with us. It's been a pleasure for me. I thank you for giving me your time and attention today, and I've been honored to be here. Thank you all very, very much.